ਤੇ ਨਾ ਹੋਈ ਕੀ ਇਹ ਹੋਈ ਹੋ ਕੋ ਆਈ ਨਾ ਕਪਾਈ ਤੋ ਕਪਾਈ ਪਰ ਕੋ ਉਹ ਕਰਨਾ ਇਹ ਯਾ ਕੋ ਯਾ ਇਹ ਓਏ ਯਾ ਕੀ ਹੋਣਾ Father God take this sickness from me in the name of Jesus purge this typhus from my body so that I might return home home to Hawaii my poor countrymen who are yet living in a region and shadow of death not knowing the true God ignorant of the future world have no bible to read no sabbath i must go i must return oh the god give me the strength to stand the strength to sail upon the sea once again talk any english ah uh, i bet the captain sent you in here didn't he yeah uh, he's always saying he wants us sailors to show you island boys how to do stuff thinks he can turn you brown savages into civilized folk <laughs> oh brownie today's your lucky day what do you want to learn i know i'll show you how to use a comb except i don't actually own a comb i would teach you how to read but you're going to have to wait till somebody teaches me first <laughs> if you want to learn how to read you're going to have to go see russell hubbard he's always got his nose buried in a book <laughs> hey i know show you how to tie a shoe. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, there's another pair under that chair over there. Go ahead and put them on those big old brown feet of yours. Uh, all right, Brownie. Pay attention cuz this is going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to learn. First, uh, you're going to take one string and you make a little loop and you take the other string uh, and you're going to go over you're going to come under up and through there i'll show you again all right yeah you make a loop uh, you go over under up uh, and through there we go now don't expect to get this on the first try uh, it's going to take you months to learn how to do this hey you got it that's it wow let's have a look at that all the other brown monkeys can't even learn how to hold a fork right and here you are tying your shoe in the first lesson you're a smart one Hey. Ain't you the one they call uh, uh well, Opal Opal Poo Poo or something? Yeah. That's you. I hear you're the one who watched his whole family get killed. Yeah. It's probably why you're on this boat, isn't it? To get away. Smart. <laughs> you know what I think? I think uh smart monkey like you is going to need a smart guy name and if you ask me opal poo poo sounds pretty ridiculous i think i'll call you henry yeah that's 
a smart name if I ever heard one. From now on, your name's going to be Henry. <laughs> well, Henry, I may as well keep on practicing how to tie your shoes. Captain wants you brownies taught really well. This boat still has to sail all the way around Africa before we reach New England, so you got a lot of time. Uh, as for me, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll just sit right here and uh, rest my bones. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> the slashing of the stomach. A name to remember my aunt who died in labor. My uncle cuts open the belly of her lifeless body to retrieve the unborn child inside. There is death in that name. It is a name I no longer go by. A relic of a life I no longer live. Now, I live only to serve you, Lord. I live to fill my own belly with the teachings of your holy scriptures so that I can take those scriptures back to my homeland. Though I can scarce remember the details of its character, my thoughts seldom drift to those things. But this this I know to be by design. The Holy Father would have me contemplate on his goodness alone, not of a people who remain yet without light. The only reminder of my homeland are my fellow countrymen who, like me, have made their home here among the good, God-fearing people of this land. John Honolii, William Kanui, and, of course, Thomas. Miss Hopu, my friend, my confidant. Each of them is as changed as I am. Each of them have found comfort in the Lord. When I look at their faces, I do not see the brown of their skin. I see only their souls, white as snow, washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> They have come to visit me many times here in my deathbed. We pray, we laugh, we speak of the goodness of God. And I say to them just what the same thing I will say to my people of Hawaii when I return. You must love God or else you will perish forever. God gave his son to die for you. I want to have you love God very much. Father God, I beg of you. Allow me to be the vessel to bring the balm of healing to those people. I will show them all that you have shown me. I will tell them of the good things that you have done for me here in this land. For never have I not felt the loving welcome of the many churches and congregations that surround me. And always have I found open the doors of the many places of learning this land holds. Bradford Academy in Massachusetts, the Theological Seminary in Andover, Morris Academy where I studied Hebrew, geography, arithmetic. I have learned so much. And it was by your grace that I have been so quick to learn. For when you would have me literate, you placed in my path Mr. Hubbard, and upon that boat he opened my mind to the gift of reading. When you wanted my hands to learn the labor of this land, you provided me with work in the many farms and fields of Massachusetts. And when you desired to have my soul receive the power of your gospel, you placed in my life men anointed in your spirit, men who have planted precious seeds of truth within me, men who have changed my life. Reverend Perkins, Jeremiah Fuller, Edwin Dwight, Reverend Dwight, and of course, 
my dear brother, Samuel Mills. Samuel. Henry. Henry, I, I am so happy, so very happy for you. Welcoming the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into your heart is the single most important moment in a person's entire life. Oh, and how it pleases me that it was you who have come to this decision on your own. No one coerced you. No one forced you. It was the pureness of your heart that has led you, my friend. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Yes, Henry. Yes, Matthew 5, verse 8. Very good. My, but you do have an astounding memory. <laughs> right. You have been here in, in Connecticut for barely two years, and already you have learned so much. But believe me when I tell you that, Henry, this is merely the beginning. With God, you will experience growth tenfold. You will be changed. You will be born again. Henry, you will be a new man. Henry, you must realize that no more can you cleave to your former beliefs in any way. You yourself have told me of the idol-worshipping ways of your people. Those wooden images are false, Henry. They are vile in the eyes of God. You come from a lost people, a people who abide in chaos, heathenism. Oh, but do forgive me, my dear friend. You must miss your people terribly. Henry, I simply mean that Gone are the days of dwelling in darkness. Gone is Obukaya, the heathen. Born is Henry, the man of God. Oh, Henry, and to think of the testimony that you will have. It will be a story to inspire. The heathen that shed his wicked ways and found comfort in the Lord. And think of all the lives that will be led to Christ because of you, Henry. People, souls from all around the world giving themselves over to the mighty hand of God. Henry, I never told you this, but four years ago, several colleagues and myself had gathered at a place called Sloan's Meadow. We met beneath the stars that evening to discuss ways that we could spread the word of God, not only here, but beyond Connecticut, beyond the seas even, to foreign lands abroad. But as soon as our meeting commenced, the heavens above began to rumble angrily. It seemed the more we spoke, the louder the sky roared and bellowed until the sky let loose its fury, the night Filled with lightning, thunder shook the ground beneath our feet. Torrents of rain descended upon us. We had little choice but to seek shelter beneath a nearby haystack. There the five of us sat, our bodies drenched, and our minds filled with confusion, doubt. Was this sudden storm the Lord's way of telling us to stop? end this mission before it begins, allow those heathens of foreign lands to find their way on their own? Or was this storm a test, an opportunity for us to strengthen our resolve and remain steadfast in our desire to do his work? Henry, you cannot know the gift that you have given me today. For it is in this very moment, four years after shivering beneath that haystack, that the final shred of doubt has finally left my mind. Henry, you will be the key to completing the work we began all those years ago. Thank you, my friend. Oh. Oh, but do forgive me <laughs> for intruding upon this precious moment. This momentous occasion is yours to celebrate, not mine. Henry, Henry, it is time. 
time to pray. <laughs> you needn't be nervous. You need only to open yourself up to the miraculous power of God. Come, let us close our eyes together. And when you are ready, speak the words of your heart. Great, eternal God, make heaven, make earth, make everything, have mercy on me, make me understand the Bible, make me good. I remember every word that I uttered in that prayer. And I remember you, Samuel. Dear friend, it was you that led me to that moment. <coughs> Samuel, how I wish that you were here with me now. How I long to be in the loving midst of your family again. When I first came to this land, it was they who took me in. I came here alone. I had no family, neither a father, nor a mother, nor a brother. I <laughs> I whispered to my mother. She is holding my baby brother in her arms. She tries to soothe him, to keep him calm, but her hands tremble uncontrollably. The bad men, they have come. They have followed us into the forest. They draw near, but father, father has fled. He runs from us. He runs when we need him the most. <laughs> hand covers my mouth. It is mother. Her eyes, eyes filled with fear and concern, tell me to be silent. Father, father draws the bad men away from us. He will give himself over so that we might live. <laughs> My brother, he cries. My mother, in her panic to silence my mouth, has dropped his body to the ground, and now his crying wail rings throughout the forest. The bad men, they hear, they come for us. They seize my mother, and they grab me by my wrists and pull me into the air. I try to fight them. My hope will not go. But the men, they are too powerful. I'm just a boy. hits the side of my face. It is the ground. I am free. The bad men have released me. Father, Father has come back. He fights the men. Kuheretela, he says to me. Run. I do. I grab my little brother from the ground and I run as fast as my little legs can take me. I stop for just a moment to hoist my brother onto my back. And in that moment, in that moment, I hear a scream. It is the voice of a woman screaming in horrible pain, followed by the shriek of a man releasing his final roar of defiance. They are gone. My legs have begun to run again, but my mind is without thought. My run is aimless. I clutch my brother's arms above my neck. I squeeze them tight, too tight. I run. My brother is screaming, but my ears can barely hear. I grip him tighter still. I am breaking the bones in his tiny arms, but my hands refuse to release their grip. They are gone. 
the ground hits the side of my face again. Something powerful has jolted me from behind. My little brother screams. I'm stopped. Blood then starts to run down my neck and pool beneath my face. The blood, it is not my own. The bad men came in a time of war. The new chief had risen to power and my family had paid the ultimate price. And yet, I survived. Why? The man who murdered my brother and my parents took pity on me, and for a time he raised me as his own. Why? My life alone was spared, but I wished it hadn't been. I wish that that spear hadn't stopped at my brother's back, but went clean through the both of us. Emptiness. Pure and utter emptiness was all that I was left with. I wanted to be free. Free of the pain. Free from those horrible memories. But then, a path opened before me. The further I followed that path, the farther away those memories were, the more I was able to shed every scrap of my former life. I was given a new name. I had earned a new identity. I had sailed away to a land where I could replace the, that emptiness with something else. I then began to study the language of this land until I could speak it, read it, and write it as well as anyone. I devoted every waking moment to studying pronunciation, structure, and syntax. I then began to work on my own books of reading, spelling, and grammar, knowing, and I wrote down each sound and word of my own native tongue, knowing that never before had a tool like this been created. I then started to take on the task of translating the Holy Bible into the Hawaiian language, and suddenly, it all made sense. Why it was that I survived, while the rest of my family perished? Why it was that that boat docked at Kealakikua Bay at precisely the right moment in time? And why? For the past nine years, I have met so many God-fearing men of the cloth. I was chosen, chosen to lead my people to salvation. I then began to obsess over the very place that I ran from. I became driven by the thought of bringing healing to a lost people, a people whose ways brought me so much pain. My calling had come, and I was certain of my purpose. Only. I am not the bringer of healing. I am the one who must receive it. I ran from those bad men all those years ago. And until this very moment, my feet have not stopped. My name is not Henry. My name is Ofukahana. It is a name I will no longer run from. There is death in that name, but from that death, a child lived. sick. I have no pain. I 
you. Well, Rest of life <coughs> leaves my body. My earthly remains were taken to the old Cornwall cemetery and placed within a stone box. There I lay, looking up at the beautiful sky, the trees around me. And many have gathered, friends, they weep, they sleep, they rejoice, and then a great stone is heaved above my grift, blocking out the sky, dimming the light. In this tomb there is rest, only rest. But then, after an age, the stone falls away, and above me is the face of a woman, a face filled with Come. 